Hello, so now I'm going to give the lecture on the right to non-discrimination. And so I shall share my screen. Okay, so the right to non-discrimination. And I'll just remind uh, what we talked about in the first day of class is uh, that human rights law, the human rights system is the a positivized system. It's a means of going from the ideas of human rights to the realization of human rights. And so now today we're going to talk about some of those specific uh, positivized, those legal uh, system that uh, has defined what non-discrimination is. So first, the whole first part, we'll discuss a little bit about what is non-discrimination? What is equality? How is it dealt with? And then we'll try to get into some more very specifics with uh, cases about what is, uh, how non-discrimination is defined in the various human rights treaty mechanisms. So to start with, the general legal principle of non-discrimination. And these are the moral norms from which the, the laws have developed. And these are just some of them. You can find many different sources uh, going all the way back to Aristotle uh, about uh, talking about what equality is and if there is equality. And uh, I'll let you read those another time. So uh, this uh, legal principle of non-discrimination, bringing these general ideas forward into uh, legal norms. That happened, as we talked about in the first day of class in 1945 with the UN Charter. And so the UN Charter itself has uh, the right to uh, equality, uh, the right to non-discrimination in the Charter itself. And there's a number of different uh, provisions that talk about equality. And so it's, it's actually, as Thomas Bergenthal says, uh, the principle of equality is the only unambiguous and specifically articulated right within the Charter itself. And the Charter being the foundational and cornerstone document of international law, and which is also uh, the cornerstone document of international human rights law, uh, it shows the importance of equality and non-discrimination in human rights law, that it's the only one, that it's the only right that's actually articulated in the UN Charter. Uh, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, three years later in 1948, also talks about equality um, in the preamble, paragraph one, in article one, uh, for example, article one, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This reflecting very much what uh, that first slide with the three individuals talking about the moral norms of rights. And uh, uh, Rene Cassin, who was a very key member of the drafting committee, one of the ones who actually uh, wrote uh, many of the drafts. He said that the principle of equality is historically established with a broad meaning that is well known. Uh, the importance of equality is illustrated by the fact that every person was a citizen of the United Nations. So he's looking to that first phrase in the UN Charter, we the peoples. And uh, so, uh, it just emphasizes again the importance that uh, equality is uh, in the human rights system and then the importance of non-discrimination. But it's still a, a kind of a general principle. We, we're, not, we're not getting into any specifics about what, you know, the law is not telling us what is non-discrimination, what is required. Again, this legal principle of non-discrimination, that there are equality clause, clauses in all of the human rights treaties little asterisk there because, of course, on the first line, the UDHR with the asterisk is not a treaty. It's a, it's a General Assembly resolution, and we talked about the nature of that and the potential growth, growing nature of it uh, yesterday. But all of the human rights treaties, they have, uh, they state what the nature of rights are, and they, in the implementation of each of the rights, it's to be done without distinction of any kind, without discrimination of any kind. And the regional treaties as well have these types of clauses. 
but still we're not getting to any like real definition of what is non-discrimination. And uh, all of these, these equality clauses are, are very much uh, uh, simply saying, what is the nature of the obligations of states? So we're coming from a state obligation perspective. In the ob when the states act, they're to act uh, without discrimination or without distinction. Now, there are two uh, aspects of um, uh, equality, as Ronald Dworkin has mentioned. So he divides it into the right to equal treatment and the right to treatment as an equal. And it's important to understand the difference between these as we start to get into the more specifics of non-discrimination. But the right to equal treatment is, uh, as the statute of justice is, a blind justice. There's, uh, the state is blindfolded. They don't see any um, differences in people and that there's procedural treatment of everyone the same. With the right to treatment as an equal, uh, justice is not blind, the state is not blind, the state actually sees the difference, differences in individuals, and recognizes that different people need different things uh, in order to get to equal treatment. So that's a sub substantive comparison of circumstances. So one is the more procedural treatment, everyone's gonna get treated the same no matter what, and the other one is, well, we need to look at the circumstances of each individual to see how they might be treated the same by actually taking action which is different toward each of the different groups of individuals or individuals. So to explain that more fully, Ronald Dworkin uh, uh, gives an, analysis, uh, an analogy. And so he says, if justice is blind and with the, you know, on the right here, the right to equal treatment, and the right to equal treatment if uh, two children are sick, one, the potential uh, result of that sickness is just a stomach ache. The other, the potential sickness is death. When the state only, if the state only has one uh, dose of medicine, it, it has no way of deciding which child is to get this because they're gonna treat everybody equally. And so their, their circumstances are irrelevant, treat everybody equally. And a, 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 comparative, a comparative example of this is the Black Lives Matter movement, that uh, there, there is a, the reaction to the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States has been the all, all lives matter. And so we, we can't look at whether you're black or white or, or anything, it's just all lives matter, but it's not taking into consideration the circumstances in which everybody lives or in which black people live. On the other hand, the right to treatment as an equal looks beyond the, the individuals and to see what are the consequences of the state action? What are the consequences, what are the circumstances in which they're living and what are the consequences toward each individual person? So it's not as important about uh, treating each individual um, as just a, a monolithic individual, but what are, the, what are the circumstances that they're living and what are the consequences of the state action? And a good example of this type of case is this was a case to the US Supreme Court, Grutter versus Bollinger. And there was a, a policy at the University of Michigan Law School that for, to, for admission into the law school, one of the many things that they took into consideration in the admission process was race. It wasn't a deciding factor uh, or determinant factor, but it was just one of many different things. And uh, so someone with very good grades, a white person with very good grades, they applied, they, they didn't get in and they said, well, there are other people who are uh, from minority races who are getting into the law school who have worse grades than me. You should treat everyone different. You should treat everyone the same. So they were at, in that lawsuit, they were asking the state to the right to equal treatment, treat everybody the same. I'm a person, they're a person, it doesn't matter if you're white or black. And the Supreme Court held that it was important to have a, what they call the critical mass of different races and ethnicities at the law school, both for the law school body, so that the law school body uh, uh, has sufficient diversity so that students, each individual student can get different perspectives from different groups, 
but also as a social function of giving uh, people living in different circumstances the ability to get into the law school. So the US Supreme Court found in that particular case, in that particular situation, that there's a right to treatment as an equal by looking beyond just the individuals and that there are consequences uh, and circum different circumstances that need different treatment. And the Committee on Economic, Social, and Culture Rights in General Comma 22 has reflected this view that inequality reflects social inequalities in society and unequal distribution of power. So that inequality, uh, to overcome inequality, these social inequalities, these unequal distributions of power have to be addressed. And those are the circumstances that people are living in. So you can't just, by, by just treating people, everyone, as back here, equal treatment, when these uh, inequalities and unequal distribution of power exists is to lock in those inequalities and unequal distribution of power. So to address those, you know, the, uh, the actual circumstances, the consequences have to be addressed. <clears throat> and so Ronald Dworkin, he, he summarizes this uh, analysis by saying that, we are all rightly suspicious of classifications, of treating people differently in different circumstances. They have been used to deny rather than to respect the right of equality, and we are all conscious of the consequent injustice. But if we misunderstand the nature of that injustice, uh, because we do not make the simple distinctions that are necessary to understand it, then we are in danger of more injustice still. We must take care not to use equal protection to cheat ourselves of equality. Uh, very important last sentence there. We must not take, we must not, we must take care not to use equal protection to cheat ourselves of actual equality. So in other words, we can't just say right to equal treatment uh, because that cheats us of actual uh, of actually achieving substantive equality between individuals. And the first UN Secretary General, Trigvili, he said a very similar thing. Uh, I mentioned him especially because he was uh, a student and a lecturer at the University of Oslo Law School. He's born and raised in, in Oslo. Another thing to consider when we talk about it, what is equality, and before we get into the, the, the legal aspects of equality, is uh, what Demartia said and poses the question, well, equality of what? When we're talking about equality, there are many different metrics, many different measures of equality uh, to compare. And so he says that equality can be defined according to many, yeah, many different comparative measurements, and that human rights entails an equal freedom to achieve, an equality in the control over one's destiny or equality of capabilities. So if you're familiar with Amartya Sen's uh, capabilities approach, that people have uh, uh, the ability to choose their own destiny, to choose their, what they want to do with their life. And so it's not for the state to decide what the measure of equality should be, it's for the individual to decide what the measure of equality should be. So for the state even to say that uh, welfareism, for example, measures equality. So if, if everybody has the same amount of money, then everyone is equal, is to say that uh, everyone should value money, but not everyone equally values money. Many people val value other things. And so it's not for the state to set the measurement of what uh, equality should be. What Demartya Sen says is equality should be when everyone can equally decide over what they value and what they want to pursue in their lives. So just a reminder from the first day as well about respect, protect, and fulfill. And we'll just put that into the perspective of equality and non-discrimination. There are state obligations toward equality, of course, and the first one to respect. And so these are just some examples of many that uh, in the different treaties, uh, and there are many cases on these as well. That, uh, so for example, in the Convention for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, 
It says that state parties shall not permit public authorities or public institutions, national, local, to promote or incite racial discrimination. Because of course, for the state to promote or incite racial discrimination, they're not respecting equality. Uh, remember, the respecting is the shield. You know, states should not do things that um, harm uh, individuals, the do no harm aspect. And CDAO says a similar thing that states shall refrain from engaging in any act or practice of discrimination against women and to ensure that public authorities and institutions shall act in conformity with this obligation. So that was respect. And then also states have, with relation to equality, have an obligation to protect, and that's to protect against uh, third parties, other individuals who might want to, uh, or, or through their actions, uh, discriminate against uh, a person or a group of people. So uh, here's a couple of cases in the Human Rights Committee. This uh, Nalik versus Austria. Uh, the Human Rights Committee's view was that states are, quote, under an obligation to protect individuals against discrimination, whether this occurs within the public sphere or among private parties in the quasi-public sector of, for example, employment. So the state has an obligation to, to monitor and to control, um, control maybe not be the right word, but to prevent discrimination from occurring within, uh, between two private parties. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights said a similar thing in the X and Y versus the Netherlands. And so Theodore Maron, uh, quite famous uh, researcher, um, professor, he also said that uh, although contemporary human rights law focuses on the duty of governments to respect the human rights of individuals, human rights violations committed by one private person against another, for example, the perpetration of acts of egregious discrimination cannot be placed outside the ambit of human rights law if that law is ever to gain sufficient a significant effectiveness. And this is really the, the area in which uh, equality legislation and, and the development of equality uh, in contemporary times has, uh, has its most relevance is that it's, there's, I mean, of course there are states in the world that are treating people unequally, but uh, most of the unequal treatment is coming from in other individuals. And so it's the state's obligation to get involved and to prevent those other individuals from discriminating against uh, other people. And so the state's obligation is not just to, to passively uh, or to, re to reactively prevent uh, discrimination, but also work to eradicate that discrimination in, uh, in private people and in, in individuals' minds. Uh, by changing social norms. So uh, it's a number of different sources. Article 20 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, that a state must um, uh, prohibit by law any form of uh, discrimination that incites violence or, or other discrimination. Uh, and the Covenant on, uh, on the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination it says that every state party shall prohibit and bring to an end by all appropriate means, including legislation as required by circumstances, racial discrimination by any person's group or organization. So bring an end by all appropriate means. So this can be many different things through education, through awareness programs, many different policies to change the way people think uh, to prevent to, to stop them from having these discriminatory ideas, from, from seeing other people as lesser individuals. CDAO is perhaps the, the uh, Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women is probably the most um, uh, effective, uh, the, the greatest degree of requirement on the state uh, that states shall take all appropriate measures, including legislation to modify or abolish existing laws, regulations, customs, explicitly customs, and practices which constitute discrimination against women. So the state 
as a state obligation to even change customs. So social norms that are discriminatory, state has an obligation to change those. Uh, and then the Human Rights Committee and in TuneIn versus Australia, uh, the Human Rights Committee said that it cannot accept that moral issues are exclusively, exclusively a matter of domestic concern. So moral issues, moral social norms within a state, there's no margin of appreciation in international law that the Human Rights Committee will decide whether or not that's discrimination. And if it is, then there's an obligation by the state to change those social norms. So here's a, a case uh, to illustrate these, uh, the protection, illustrate the protection against social norms. And there are two similar cases now. And the only real difference is whether or not the social norm in the state is uh, such that uh, LGBT people are accepted or not accepted. In this case, in Greece, uh, there's a, a significant degree of hostility toward LGBT people in Greece. And so what is the obligation of uh, Greece in this situation? So the question is posed, are states obligated to protect LGBT individuals, even though the prevailing cultural norms do not accept them? And the Human Rights Committee has said yes, that despite the many incidents of people being attacked or even killed, uh, and despite the small number of investigations mounted into such illegal acts, the state party should provide effective protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation. So where the, the risk is very high, the state has an obligation to uh, both prevent uh, attacks, but also to work toward changing those social norms. Well, what if uh, the state in concerned uh, doesn't really have social norms uh, that are discriminatory against the group, in this case, LGBT individuals. This was a case in Norway where uh, someone was beaten up on the street and uh, the person who, who beat them up, uh, the first, all they said when they came up to them is, is are you a, a boy or a girl? And then beat them up because they, they didn't like that it, uh, it wasn't obvious. Uh, but Norway is a state that uh, the social norm is much more accepting of LGBT individuals. Does, does Norway still have the obligation to be out there in every circumstance and just change the social norms uh, or that the social norms have changed? Uh, what are the obligations of the state in that circumstance? Well, the Human Rights Committee has said that the state, in, even in this case, should provide effective protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation. So even in uh, a case where, uh, even in, in situations where, uh, whether the state uh, social norms are accepting or not accepting, the, the state still has the obligation to push the boundaries forward of acceptance. And then, uh, this brings us to the last part. Uh, first, we did respect and then protect and now fulfill. And so this is starting to reflect what Amartya Sen was talking about, that uh, obligations toward equality and, and fulfillment of equality is like in the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the fundamental obligations laid down in the convention meant the uh, necessity to eliminate racial discrimination in all its forms and to guarantee the right of everyone to an articulated list of all of the rights. So to have equality, uh, you need all of the rights to be fulfilled. And CDAO similarly says that measures in all fields to ensure the, the full development and advancement of women, emphasizing the importance of all sets of rights. And uh, this was called the integrationist approach, that you don't enjoy uh, you don't fully enjoy your human rights unless all of your human rights are fulfilled. The uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, also an integration of rights that encapsulates different aspects of both sets of rights, civil and political and economic and social cultural rights, thereby reflecting their indivisibility. And, and what this is saying is that uh, equality is not enjoyed until all rights are enjoyed. And when all, when, 
when everyone has similar or equal enjoyment of rights, that's when equality exists. And so states have the obligation to work toward, have an equality obligation to work toward the uh, full enjoyment of rights for all individuals as a matter of equality. So, so far we've talked about uh, equality and non-discrimination from a more uh, a state obligation approach. Uh, all of those clauses uh, at the beginning of all of the human rights treaties say that, well, in the implementation of the various rights, a state is not to discriminate. Well, in Article 26 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there's also a very specific individual right. Now, you could say that those, uh, the effect of those clauses in all of the other, in all of the conventions, the start of all of the conventions, is, uh, well, if, if a state has an obligation, then an individual has a corresponding right that that obligation be fulfilled. So there's not the fine line between what the, the other things are simply obligations. But here in Article 26 in the Covenant on Civil Polit Political Rights, we have a very clear uh, right, an individual granted right of uh, non-discrimination. And what Article 26 says is that all persons are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to the equal protection of the law. In this respect, the law shall prohibit any discrimination and guarantee to all persons equal and effective protection against discrimination on any grounds such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status, leaving open the list. So it's not a closed list. And so this Article 26 is what's called a, an autonomous right to non-discrimination. It's not that um, uh, with, with the clauses at the beginning of all of the other human rights treaties, uh, that requires that in the implementation of any of the rights, then um, a state must not discriminate. And, but here, it doesn't say that in, it, it has nothing to do with in the implementation of other rights. It's simply individuals are entitled to equality. And that's what the Human Rights Committee said in this Netherlands case that the principle of non-discrimination derives from the principle of equal protection of the law without discrimination and, co and, and contained in the UDHR. And in this general comment 18, it continues that thought that Article 26 does not merely duplicate the guarantees already provided for in Article 2 in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and in Article 2 in the Convention on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights and many of the other introductory articles of all of the other uh, human rights treaties uh, or other general uh, equality statements of the human rights treaties. Instead, it is an autonomous right that is not limited to those rights which are provided for in the covenant. So, uh, and also in general comment 18 and in the same case, when legislation is adopted by a state, it must comply with the requirement of Article 26. So whenever a state does anything, then it must comply with non, the right to non-discrimination. So state action must be non-discriminatory. So what is discrimination? And uh, we'll spend the rest of this class uh, trying to understand what is discrimination from a legal perspective, because discrimination is a term of art. Uh, discrimination is not, um, uh, and the, probably the word, the, the uh, way to explain this is the contrast between the word discrimination and distinction. Distinction is when someone is treated differently. But a distinction can or cannot be, may or may not be legal. A distinction that doesn't, that does not fulfill all of these criteria is illegal. A distinction that fulfills these criteria is uh, legal. And so uh, an illegal distinction is discrimination. 
a legal distinction is not discrimination. So discrimination is a term of art that means when people are treated equal in a way that is illegal. Uh, but people might be treated, uh, uh, might not be treated equal in a way that is also legal, and that is not discrimination. So you use those terms carefully. You see the word discrimination thrown out a lot when somebody actually means, well, I'm being treated differently. Discrimination means I'm being treated differently in a way that's illegal. So, uh, and this goes, this is just mirroring the text of Article 26. So, uh, first of all, our first question is okay, is there a distinction? Is someone being treated differently? So, we, if we find that someone's being treated differently, our next question is is there a protected group? So, because if you remember the text of Article 26, it had that list. It also said others, but uh, it had a list. And so you have to be within that list in order to, um, for Article 26 to apply to you. So, as you can see here, this list here is longer than the one that was on Article 26. Uh, and that's because through jurisprudence, the list has, been, has grown uh, to include to articulate other groups uh, that um, require protection. And so what the Human Rights Committee, uh, they required what they call an identifiable social group. That's the threshold to be in that other status. So either you're one of the articulated uh, groups, race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national, ethnic, or social origin or you're in one of the other status groups, but it, you have to have an identifiable social group. It can't just be, uh, I'm uh, being treated badly, I don't like it, uh, or uh, me and my friends are not being treated well. Are, are you and your friends an identifiable social group? You might be, but uh, probably not. So we'll just look at uh, that uh, a little bit more. So uh, do these people fall into one of those categories? So I'll take the one in the middle first, a transgender identity. The Human Rights Committee has found specifically and most of the other human rights, uh, most of the other committees attached to the human rights mechanisms and on treaties have found that transgender people or gender identity is a group that is protected. So, there would be a protected group for someone with a transgender identity. Uh, also someone who is in biologically intersex, uh, that is also an identifiable social group. Uh, but if we look at the one on the left, uh, they have no transgender identity. It's, they simply wear different clothes and present themselves in a different way. Things could develop uh, in the law such that that would, might be considered at some point an identifiable social group. Um, if we were to say, I mean, you could say that cross-dressers might be an identifiable social group, but somebody who doesn't even identify as that has no, identi no identif self-identification into any of these groups can hardly claim to be a member of an identifiable social group. So in that case on the left, if there's no uh, identity issue involved with it, then it's not an issue of non-discrimination. There, there's still a right involved, and that would be the right to privacy, but it wouldn't be uh, fall within Article 26 on non-discrimination. So to make, to drive that point home, uh, if uh, an individual simply wears uh, a dress and cross dresses uh, for, for just to be wild and crazy at a senior prom or senior dance, is non-discrimination involved? And like I said, I mean, if, the, if there was an identity issue, it would be yes, but without that status, it's simply a right to privacy. It's not a discrimination issue. So the, the point to get here is you need an identifiable social group, not just an individual who's being treated differently. Uh, so again, just to illustrate this, uh, the distinction between these two groups, if a woman is arrested for wearing pants, that's an Article 26 non-discrimination issue because uh, she's from an identifiable social group of uh, 
based on sex, that she's a woman and women in Sudan uh, were not allowed to wear pants. But if it was just a pants issue, if it was just what you want to wear, uh, if, and this was actually a case in the US, a man being arrested for wearing saggy pants at a shopping mall, uh, that's not a identifiable social group. Maybe it may develop into that in, in, in social norms that we would consider saggy pants wearers to be a social group. Uh, but at this point in time, it's not considered an identifiable social group. So that would not be a non-discrimination issue. That would be a right to privacy issue under Article 17. And, and this would uh, be the same thing, that uh, there are lots of regulations about uh, hair length or the way somebody appears. Uh, I think the, the woman on the right, she was actually a lawyer in a law office and she lost her job because of it, because of the, the way she liked to do her makeup. And, uh, but it was found not to be a non-discrimination issue. And the reason being because it's not, it's not considered an identifiable social group, people who like to wear lots of makeup. Uh, what about people who are overweight? We can distinguish this from just simple uh, life choices uh, with people wearing makeup or, or long hair. That's a much more complex issue. In, in uh, well, I have to look to the United States for the strange cases, but there have been a number of cases in the United States on this very issue that uh, restrictions have been made on airplanes or in restaurants or in various circumstances. There's even a, a, a situation where a town, I think in California, had uh, uh, outlawed in the same way that a bar is legally prohibited from serving alcohol to a drunk person. Uh, they passed a law that a fast food restaurant was uh, prohibited from serving fast food to an obese person. And uh, so in, in that case, is is this a um, identifiable social group? I think this, this could probably be argued that it is. Uh, it's not clear law at this point, but uh, more of a, a shade of gray between um, a right to privacy and a non-discrimination issue. I would say that you could probably make this case as a non-discrimination issue as an identifiable social group. Uh, what about the way people think? A uh, person on the left, he was a teacher in Canada and he was a Holocaust denier and he lost his job because of it. Uh, he was teaching that the Holocaust didn't exist. Uh, on the right was also something in school where a uh, teacher was suspended because the students were doing a pledge allegiance to Obama, in sort of military, military style fashion. Is, is this not political or other opinion? And while this might raise other issues in human rights, it's not a non-discrimination issue. So uh, the case on the left actually went to the Human Rights Committee and I found that it was not a, a, a non-discrimination issue. So there, there's no identifiable social group of people who deny the Holocaust. And you could bring, you could make parallels to that uh, with anti-vaccinations and anti-mask wearing that uh, we see today. Uh, whether or not that's an identifiable social group, whether or not the right to non-discrimination is involved in that. Okay, so that was it, whether or not there is a protected social group. Uh, and if there is a protected social group, then you can move to the next test and whether or not the distinction is objective. Is the, is the law being made to target specific individuals? So what about this law? Uh, it shall be an infraction. It should be it shall be illegal, a minor illegal, um, uh, minor illegality, punishable by a monetary fine up to a thousand dollars and imprisonment up to thirty days, to distribute food in any public place for which there is no cost to the recipients. So it became illegal. I think this was in Florida. Yeah, Orlando, Florida. It, it was made illegal to give away food and. 
the target of this um, uh, Orlando City uh, statute was homeless people. And a, a group called Food Not Bombs was feeding the homeless. And so uh, Orlando made it illegal to feed the homeless. And so you see on the left, uh, the police arresting one of the organizers of uh, the uh, feeding of the homeless in, in a public park. And the arrest warrant is, is almost tragically comical to read. It says something like, uh, uh, the suspect was seen uh, using a or passing out food to unknown individuals, more than 30 unknown individuals without receiving money in return, uh, scooping uh, what appeared to be soup out of a large bowl with a, a ladle, a big spoon. Uh, and to, to demonstrate, you know, this is bad because uh, homeless people are being given food. And so this law would probably not pass the objective test because while it's objective on its face, you don't see anywhere that it says it's illegal to feed homeless people. The way it's written is you can see it's quite obviously targeting homeless people. So it's not uh, objective. It has a specific purpose to uh, discriminate against a, a specific group. And then uh, if uh, there is no targeting of a, of a specific group, then the next test is whether or not it's reasonable. Is the distinction reasonable? Is treating someone different reasonable? Well, one of the uh, issues in reasonableness is whether or not there's a disparate impact, whether or not there's an effect that uh, there's a, uh, a difference in effect on individuals. So the Human Rights Committee has said in this general comment 18, that Article 26 prohibits discrimination in law. So this would be discrimination in law, but the law itself discriminated against different individuals. Or discrimination in fact, in any field regulated and protected by public authorities. So if the discrimination, uh, even if the law was, was not discriminatory on its face, if it had a discriminatory effect in its implementation, then that is also discrimination uh, um, that can be illegal. So the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination has uh, said a similar thing that in determining if an action has an unlawful effect, the committee will examine whether there is an unjustifiable disparate impact upon a group. So uh, you know, is, is one particular group being affected worse than another? And there's, is there any justification for that difference? Of course, there can be one group that's affected uh, what that is justifiable. So if we think back to the law school case, uh, Black people were getting uh, positions at the law school, uh, and white people were not getting as many positions at the law school, a disparate impact on uh, white people, uh, white applicants. But that was, in that case, that was justifiable. There was a justifiable reason for it. Uh, also in the reasonable test, uh, we'll just look at a quick case. Uh, this was a case uh, in Australia in the state of Tasmania. And at the time, uh, homosexual relations were prohibited. And one of the justifications for the provision for this prohibition on homosexual relations in private homes anywhere uh, was to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS in what was considered a health crisis. And so very relevant to today, the question being posed, is it reasonable and objective to restrict private sexual relations between consenting adults? And so you could think well, on the one hand, in a health crisis, all steps to curb the spread of a disease are permitted. Apply that maybe to COVID. Or no, banning all homosexual relations is disproportionate to the health benefits. And what the Human Rights Committee said was no, that the criminalization of homosexual practices cannot be considered a reasonable means or proportionate measure to achieve the aim of preventing the spread of AIDS HIV. So it was disproportionate. It was just uh, the, the ban on sexual relations was just too extreme uh, 
and uh, so it was not reasonable. And the court or the committee also noted that the criminalization ran counter to the implementation of effective education, the ability to give to educate people about uh, what are safe practices. And then uh, finally, the I think this is the last uh, test. If we passed all the other tests, then we get to is the distinction legitimate? Is the objective of what the state is trying to achieve by the distinction a legitimate objective, a human rights uh, objective? And so in this case, there was a popular event at bars in France called uh, dwarf throwing. So dwarves, uh, sh little people, short, shorter people, and in uh, they would voluntarily, you know, willingly uh, employ themselves as uh, objects to be thrown in a bar, and whoever threw the dwarf the farthest would win. And uh, so many little people voluntarily took part in this because they provide an income because it's a group that otherwise uh, suffers significant unemployment. So this provided a good source of income for them. So a law was passed specifically prohibiting the throwing of dwarfs. And so a case was brought by someone claiming that the law had deprived him of his livelihood. The question is, is it a legitimate objective to interfere in voluntary activities of individuals in this circumstance? So you could think on the one hand, the throwing of human beings for sport degrades everyone's human dignity, turning them into objects or means rather than ends. Uh, or off the, if we bring the, the holding of the tune-in case forward, we could say, well, these are consulting, consenting adults entering into private contracts that are not hurting anyone. But the Human Rights Committee in this case said that yes, uh, the law was aimed to achieve equality, especially for little people, by preserving human dignity. The freedom of expression ends when the result is the, uh, that sentence is uh, somehow fed in there from somewhere else. So the, the, the issue here was uh, preserving human dignity and preserving human dignity was a legitimate objective of the state. Uh, and just as a side note, the committee also found that the law was uh, objective that even though it was the law specifically said that uh, dwarves could not be thrown, uh, the committee said that uh, it didn't single out a particular group, holding that if these persons are covered by the exclusion of others, the reason is that they are the only persons capable of being thrown. Thus, the differentiation between the persons covered by the ban, dwarves, and those to whom it does not apply, persons not suffering from dwarfism, is based on an objective reason and is not discriminatory in its purpose. So the, the Human Rights Committee read the statute as it's actually saying uh, people cannot be thrown for sports, even though it actually said dwarves cannot be thrown for sport. And so the Human Rights Committee was willing to look away from that. Uh, but the, the main holding there is saying that uh, this was a, a violation of human dignity, it reduced all individuals. And uh, so addressing that was a legitimate objective of the state. Uh, also uh, on the question, is the distinction legitimate? In this case, there was a popular song lyrics that demonized gay people uh, and sang about physically assaulting them. And the question is, is it legitimate for the state to limit another person's freedom of expression in order to protect gay people? And the Human Rights Committee held that yes, song lyrics that incite violence against a protected group are legitimate subjects of regulation. So the rights have to be balanced at some point. And uh, as long as the objective is legitimate, then it will pass at least this part of the uh, discrimination test. So just to, uh, to wrap up, we've gone through all of these different uh, steps in, and, and this is very much uh, a non-discrimination and uh, defining discrimination in a nutshell. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of nuance between these different steps. But if you make it through all of these steps, and I didn't have any examples on the last one, 
is whether the, the reason for the distinction is continuing. Of course, the, it always has to be valid, uh, all of the, the other steps uh, farther up that, uh, that that's continuing. And uh, because once the, for like, for example, the University of Michigan case, once uh, uh, everyone equally could get into the, uh, into the law school, and white people and black people were equally represented in law school, there would be no need to have that additional criteria in the acceptance proce uh, procedure. So the reason for that distinction was no longer continuing. And so um, uh, even if it met all the other criteria, the, the distinction would fail, the discrimination testing would be illegal once that occurs. And so if it passes all of the tests, then the distinction is legal. If it fails any one of the tests, then the distinction is illegal and then it can be called discrimination. And so that is uh, wraps up uh, this um, session on discrimination. So thank you very much. And any questions here, uh, welcome to contact me uh, in any of these ways. And so I shall say uh, thank you for now and we'll see you soon in another session.